Alrighty, y'all. How you going? We're looking at an awesome Discord suggestion from Matey Potati. <laughs> I love that name. Interesting. Uh, this is why Australia bottles up its air. Bottles up its air. That sounds absolutely crazy. I will say, uh, I actually, whether you want to believe it or not, I have gotten a bottle of air. <laughs> I think once or twice from mail time from you guys. So I have had pure Australian air in a bottle before. Maybe I can speak for this. I don't know. We're going to find out what the uh, shakedown on this is. This is from a channel called Tom Scott. I am subscribed to this channel. It's amazing. It really interesting uh, channel. I highly suggest you check it out with the link down below. Watch this whole video uninterrupted. And of course, browse his channel. Here we go, guys. Every few months, a team from the Australian Government Science Agency, CSIRO, and the Australian Bureau of Meteorology will bottle up air from here at the northern tip of Tasmania what? and send it off to be archived. A few days ago, back on the Australian mainland in a suburb of Melbourne, I interviewed one of the team at the Air Archive to explain how and why. The first. Can I just say before we even get going here, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you look at how windy it is, <laughs> if you know anything about filming outside, even if there's the slightest wind, it just ruins your audio unless you have a really good setup. Uh, they must have really good setup. I'm assuming he has some sort of microphone uh, underneath his sweater or something because he is like getting blown around and the audio's pretty damn good. Days ago, back on the Australian mainland in a suburb of Melbourne, I'm impressed. I interviewed one of the team at the Air Archive to explain how and why. The first tank was taken on the 26th of April, 1978. All up, we have close wow. to 200 tanks spanning almost 50 years. The pressure they what? get to is around about 900 PSI. <laughs> they're 34 litre tanks, which means they hold around 2,000 litres of air once they're completely full. This place, Taniok Cape Grim, has the cleanest air. So that was literally tanks and tanks and tanks of air. I didn't know something like this existed. Cape Grim Baseline Air Pollution Station. Very interesting. Grim has the cleanest air in the world. When the wind's blowing from wow. the southwest, when that air has traveled thousands of kilometers across the Southern Ocean without touching land. So that is a monitoring station, testing wow. levels of dozens of gases and chemicals in the atmosphere. When we say clean air or baseline air, That's we mean that it has not had recent contact with land right. or pollution sources. And we know that it's very representative of the mid latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere background air. And most of the sources of the major greenhouse gases are in the Northern Hemisphere because that's I never thought of that. That actually makes sense. That air has traveled around so much open ocean in the Southern Hemisphere and makes contact if it's in the right conditions coming from that wind direction from the South to Tasmania. That is ultra clean air. That is wild. <laughs> That's not like the air in Chicago. Sources of the major greenhouse gases are in the Northern Hemisphere because that's where the major population centers are. It takes right. about a year to do the interhemispheric transport. Okay. Going across the equator is much, much slower than the mixing within a hemisphere itself. We wait until the wind is coming from the southwest direction and normally we wait several hours. Today, the wind is not blowing in the right direction. <laughs> it's blowing in from the cities in Tasmania and the Australian mainland. Okay. But the team here are going to do a practice fill of an archive cylinder so they can show you what would happen. Wow. And it's a really technical operation that has to avoid contamination. Is it always that windy there? He is almost getting blown off that platform. <laughs> Yikes. Cylinders are filled cryogenically under vacuum. When they're put into the liquid nitrogen, the air naturally will be sucked into the tanks over a two to three hour period. As any gas cools wow. down, it compresses. So initially, the air rushes in to fill the vacuum, but then it hits liquid nitrogen chilled stainless steel. So it cools and compresses and more air rushes in, which cools and compresses and so on and so on and so on. It's a really clever way to fill a pressurized canister wow. without pumps. We then let it heat up. No pumps. This is wild. How did they think up? You know, Australia has, I, I, one thing I've learned is they always have surprises. Uh, over the last year and a half, two years, however long it's been learning about Australia, there's always like tons of inventions I didn't know that came from Australia. Uh, tons of like medical breakthroughs that came from Australia. Uh, they really, damn, they just think of some wild stuff down there. It's really kind of cool. And this is just I don't really even know what to say. Uh, it's really bizarre. 
in the best way. Uh, imagine working here and uh, you get in casual conversation with somebody and, uh, oh, what do you do? Well, I literally bottle up air. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I bottle up air for the Australian government. Really clever way to fill a pressurized canister without pumps. We then let it heat up or warm up and then we blast whatever water is in there out. There is water in the tanks because there's water in the atmosphere and we don't do any drying. We don't want mm. to use pumps or any particular drying agent or method as this can okay. potentially contaminate in the tanks. That, so I have an obvious question. Sense. How do they know that the air in the archive tanks doesn't change over time through some chemical reaction or osmosis through a faulty valve or right. microbe contamination? Right. We take measurements of the archive regularly. Maybe once a year we'll take a, a sniff out of each of the cylinders, so to speak to ensure <laughs> trace gases are not drifting or changing. Okay. There is a little bit of moisture and water in there. And there has been concerns where the microbes might be changing the composition for some trace gases. But for what okay. we've discovered so far, that's not really the case. So, wow. got so the for the most part, it's actually staying relatively pretty stable, not contaminated, even on a micro level, really. Because I would think, even though I'm sure that's uh, ob quite obviously scientifically well done, it's well executed, and of course, uh, well sealed, you would just think after, I don't know, say some of the older uh, bottles or tanks there, you would think after, you know, 20 years, maybe it's gathered up some humidity in there. I don't know. It sounds like they're pretty damn clean. <laughs> What do they do with it? Well, let's say someone discovers that actually there's a greenhouse gas or some other contaminant that we should have been testing for for the last 50 years or so. The researchers can go to the archive, pull samples from the tanks, oh. and use modern equipment to test old air. Remember CFCs? They've been testing for those on site here for years, but it oh. turns out the replacements also cause problems. After the CFCs were the interim replacements, HCFCs, and then the replacements for those HFCs. It's only recently we've had the technology to be able to measure those, to build up a history back in time to 1978. Wow. That would not be possible without the archive. Some of the no measurements kidding. we do take just uh, 20 or 30 mils of air. We can actually take measurements down to parts per trillion. There was one more thing wow. that Paul showed me back at Melbourne. The Woo. first tank taken here in 1978 it's not the oldest one in the archive. No kidding. Several years ago, we did a media story and we started to get inquiries from the public saying, we've got older air than you. Um, and it turns what? out there was a lot of people out there with old scuba tanks sitting in their garages. Oh, and most scuba divers wow. kept a diary of when they dived, when and where the tank was filled. So people started to donate their scuba tanks. So we no now have kidding. air back to 1956. For some wow. trace gases that we're interested in are perfectly fine to take the measurements. All right, I am. Um... That is absolutely wild. 1956, that's pretty damn old. That air has been around longer than a lot of us watching this. Um, that was really interesting. Excellent suggestion. Uh, excellent coverage from this channel as always. So make sure to check out the link down there. I would really love to hear your insight on this, your thoughts. Did you know this was a thing? I've never heard of anything like this in my life. Uh, so I'm very intrigued by it quite fascinated. Turns out it's pretty useful as well. Uh, this is just kind of mind-blowing all around. Uh, so that was awesome. I really liked that. Throw a like on there if you enjoyed that. Subscribe to be part of this amazing community. My name is Ian. You watch the 9W Rocker. And until next time, y'all, catch you later.